We are what we remember. I read about a man in a book by Joshua Four called Moonwalking with Einstein. The book's subtitle is The Art and Science of Remembering Everything. And this man, who goes by the initials E.P., they only give his initials to protect his identity, this man at, at some point in his life uh, transact, uh, he, he got herpes sim simplex, and it destroyed the, the medial temporal lobes in his brain. That's the part of your brain that turns perceptions into long-term memories. As a result of this, this poor man could not remember anything after about 1950. He was in his 80s when four met him in, in 2010 or so. And, and so from 1950 forward, this was a married man. He, he perceived, but he didn't remember any conversations that he had had. He had vivid memories up to, up to 1950. You could converse with him about his life prior to that point. You could ask him who the last president he remembered was, and he would name Roosevelt. His eyes, you, you could tell him about the birth of his grandchildren, and his eyes would well up with tears that he had grandchildren, and then he would promptly forget their existence. Joshua 4 writes of him that he was trapped in a limbo of an eternal present between a past that he couldn't remember and a future that he couldn't contemplate. What we're doing this morning is we are thinking about the past as the Bible describes it in order to contemplate the future as the Bible describes it in order to understand the present in which we live. Our lives are structured by what we remember. We are what we remember. One of the reasons as, as we get older, I'm 40 now, and it feels like the years are just rolling on by. One of the reasons, as we get older, it feels like the years go faster is because we're no longer experiencing things for the first time. Many of these things, we've been around this circle. We've, we've done this. We're in a, an established routine, and there aren't these big major signpost events like going off to college or maybe getting married or your first job. There aren't those, those radical transitions that mark time for us. The, the way that we remember these, these signa, signal, it, signature events, uh, this is why people remember things like 9-11 so vividly. This is why maybe you remember uh, the, the, the Challenger going down and it, it, it crashing. Maybe, maybe you remember, uh, if you're a little bit older, uh, John, F. John F. Kennedy being shot. You remember these things because they're so different now what I want to do this morning is construct for you a memory palace that you'll be able to use to remember the grand narrative and the, the big signature events in the Bible's story. A, a memory palace comes from something that happened to a Greek poet named Simonides. This, this Greek poet lived in the 5th century BC and he was at a banquet hall in, in Thessaly and just as he completed his recitation of some epic piece of Greek poetry about Odysseus or Achilles or some such figure, he was summoned outside. And as he stepped out of the banquet hall, the building collapsed and everyone inside was killed. And the carnage in the banquet hall was such that the remains of these poor people were unidentifiable. And as loved ones and spouses and parents and children began to, to assemble there and try to identify their now deceased loved one, they, they couldn't identify the bodies. And this Greek poet, Simonides, he closed his eyes and he spatially envisioned the room. And then what he did was he went and he got one of these loved, person, loved ones and he walked that person to where their beloved was seated in the room. And in that way he identified every everyone who was, who was lost in that, in that colossal wreck. From this is born this idea of the memory palace. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use a space that we know well. I'm, I'm going to use my home and the downstairs floor of my home, which has four rooms. Maybe yours is similar. We've got a formal living room over here. 
I'm sorry, formal dining room over there, formal living room over here, and then the kitchen is behind the formal dining room, and the living room is behind the formal living room, and between them at the front door is the entryway. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this space that we know well, and we're going to try to populate that space with vivid images that are going to call to mind for us these major movements in the Bible story. My hope is that if I run into you in a year or three, and you say, oh yeah, you're that guy that did the Mermaid Palace. And then you can just take a walk around the room and you're going to be able to tell me essentially the outline of my sermon. So what we're going to do is convert what we want to remember into in an, hopefully an engrossing visual image and arrange it within this imagined space. We're doing this because we are what we remember and of all things what we want to be defined by, what we want to use to to structure the world as we understand it and interpret it is the Bible. So we're actually going to start across the street at the neighbor's house. And across the street at the neighbor's house, I want you to imagine watching a movie with your, with your neighbor. And in this movie, what happens is dice invade a garden. Now this is a pristine garden. It's a perfect garden. It's like the Garden of Eden. The, the, the temperature is right, the moisture level is right, the amount of light is right, all for the producing, the growing of onions. Maybe you like sauteed onions in your Tex-Mex. So the onions in this garden are glorious. Everything's right in that glorious garden until, until the dice come rolling into that garden. Now as they come in, envision their, their white cube shaped bodies with the black dots all over them and, and envision these dice having arms and legs. And the, the dice hear them clicking against each other as they come into the garden and then once they get into the garden what they do is they begin to rub their shins. So the dice rub their shins and what you have in that perfect garden is a disruption. That stands for the disruption in creation introduced by sin. The story of the Bible is a story in which God didn't create the world for people to die in the world. God didn't create the world for hurricanes to ravage creation. God didn't create the world for parents to die long, slow, painful deaths of cancer and for children to be abused. No, God created the world and it was very good. God didn't create a world in which people have broken sexual desires that are perverse and against God's stated intentions. God created a world in which everything was very good. And you, you know that world from Genesis 1 and 2. This is a very important part of the Bible's narrative that, that is altogether different from the world's narrative and that people need to hear from us as we try to explain to them what the story of the scriptures is, what the gospel is. It begins with a holy God who makes a good creation. And then there's a disruption. And, and it's really crisply summarized by Paul in Romans 5.12. Through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. So it's important for us as we tell people the good news, as we tell people the gospel, that we insist God made the world good. And that world suffered a tragic fall as a result of man's sin. Now I'd invite you to cross the street from the neighbor's house into the front door. And as you enter into the front door, you see, to your surprise, on the ground, mice. You can hear them squeaking and chirping and you can see them scurrying and you can feel the revulsion that you would naturally respond to a, a whole horde of mice there on the, on the floor in front of you. You, you feel that, that panic and, and, and then you begin to look more closely and you realize these mice look like professionals. And, and these professional mice, they're actually doing an ice sculpture, and, and it's an ice sculpture for the prom. And, and the, the prom ice that's being sculpted by the pro mice is depicting the scene of Genesis chapter three. As God comes in judgment against against the woman and the man, but most significantly, the serpent. And, and he speaks judgment over the serpent saying, I will put enmity between, your, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he, the male 
singular seed of the woman will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Now think with me for just a moment about that scene. If, if we had watched this whole thing unfold, if we're reading through from Genesis 2, we step back and we say, wait a minute. God said, in the day you eat of the tree, you'll surely die. And then as Adam and Eve hear what God says to the serpent, they hear him say, there's going to be ongoing enmity between themselves and the serpent. I think Adam begins to think to himself, evidently we're not dying today. And then not only is the enmity going to be ongoing, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. Not only are we going to live, we're going to have a child. And the child is going to overcome the one who introduced evil into the world. And in response to this, I think Adam responds in faith. Genesis chapter 3 verse 20 tells us the man called his wife's name Eve and in Hebrew that word sounds like life because she was the mother of all living so Adam is hoping in life that's going to come as a result of the triumph of the seed of the woman over the serpent and his seed that's the promise the world was very good it, it was disrupted there was disruption the dice rubbing their shins and then the promise, sculpting the promise, tell us about God's promise to overcome the evil that has been introduced into the world. And now, from the entryway, we turn right into, in my house, the formal dining room. And in the dining room, we're, we're, we're shocked to see these imps. And you can hear, you know what an imp is, it's a really annoying little creature. And you can hear their, their screaming and their... their obnoxious and they're annoying and, and, and these are red imps. And as you, as you get over your initial reaction of, of, of confusion and shock at the, the appalling presence of these red imps in the dining room, you begin to think to yourself, they look like a marching band. You know how a marching band on the football field, they form these patterns? And these red imps are shaping themselves into the pattern of the events of the exodus from Egypt. So you can see them enacting there the, the, the uh, sacrificing of the, the Passover lamb after the, after the 10 plagues and the, the blood on the doorpost and then the people coming out of Egypt and, and they get out into the wilderness and then they're trapped between the army of Pharaoh and the Red Sea and then the Red Sea opens and they go through and then they get manna from heaven in the wilderness and water from the rock and then they arrive at Mount Sinai where God enters into covenant with them. All this is being enacted by the red imps, the pattern of redemption. The reason I'm talking about the pattern of redemption is because that pattern is tremendously significant for the rest of the Old Testament. We're not going to take the time to go there, but we could go to Hosea chapter two. And in Hosea two, I'm just gonna tell you about what you see there. The Lord is warning Israel through the prophet Hosea about how He's going to drive them into exile. And then he says, after you've, you've suffered in exile, what I'm going to do is I'm going to woo you out into the wilderness, just like Israel was brought out into the wilderness. And he says, and I will speak tenderly to you in the wilderness, just as he spoke tenderly to them from Mount Sinai. And, and, and then he begins to talk about how he's going to betroth Israel to himself in faithfulness and in righteousness and in justice. And that's exactly what happened after the pattern of redemption at the Exodus. The Lord entered into covenant with Israel and it was a marital covenant between himself and Israel. So, so we've, we've seen the disruption in the garden. Then we've seen the promise sculpting the promise. We come in and we see the pattern of redemption and then we continue into the kitchen, and what we see on the counter in the kitchen is a wedding cake. And the wedding cake is, is just perfect. The icing is so smooth, and the layers are so right, and there's, it's beautiful. There's a bride and groom on top. You can smell the wedding cake, and then you see the ants. And there are 13 of these ants going at that wedding cake, and you know that wedding cake is about to be ruined. Why are there 13 ants? Because 13 makes a coven. And, and what we're talking about here is the covenant, coven of ants, a covenant between God and Israel. So after the redemption, the exodus from 
Egypt, Israel enters into covenant with the Lord at Mount Sinai, and that is tremendously significant, this relationship between God and Israel, which is like a marital relationship. Marriage is built into the structure of reality. And when God, when God goes to give humanity a way to understand how he relates to his people, what he did was he created a world in which there would be marriage. So the Lord says, you may remember from Jeremiah 31, the Lord says through Jeremiah, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with them when I brought them out of Egypt. My covenant with thy, which, which they broke, though I was a husband to them. And, and already at Mount Sinai, the Lord is warning Israel that they are not to go and whore after other gods. That imagery presumes this marital covenant between God and his people, and it, it, it treats unfaithfulness to the Lord as spiritual adultery. So the Lord and Israel are in this marriage. Uh, we've got the, the disruption. We've got the promise sculpting the promise. We've got the pattern of redemption. We've got the covenant, the covenant of ants. Then we go from the, the kitchen into the living room. And before, we, before I, I describe for you what we find in the living room, let me, let me comment a little bit more about this covenant. Already at Mount Sinai, the people of Israel made a golden calf, didn't they? They broke the covenant. They couldn't keep the covenant even though it had just been made. Moses saw that happen, and as Moses told Israel about what awaited them in their future. He told them in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 28 through 32, told them repeatedly, this is what's going to happen. You are going to enter into the land of Israel and you're going to break this covenant, which they had already broken. But, but the Lord was merciful and they made two more tablets and they were able to go forward. You're gonna break this covenant and it's gonna to get to the point where the Lord is going to drive you out of the land. He's going to drive you into exile but from there from exile you will seek the Lord and you'll find him when you search after him with all your heart and essentially what Moses says is when you seek the Lord the Lord is going to restore you to the land so Moses is prophesying that there's going to be an exile and then a return from exile so we go from the kitchen into the living room and there in the living room, we see this strip of carpet. It looks like it's been well trodden on. And this strip of carpet, it, it, it apparently was an aisle, you know, an aisle like through these chairs here that you walk on. And it's gotten up off the floor and it's walking around and this X aisle is working at a return counter. And the exile is processing these returns and as you look at what he's doing, you see, you know, it looks like he's got a small scale version of what happened in the garden, where there was this pristine place and then there was this trans transgression, and then Adam and Eve were driven into exile from the garden. And then you watch him, watch the exile continue with what he's working on there, and he processes another return, and it looks like the pattern of red imps enacting the, the exodus from Egypt and the pilgrimage through the wilderness and then the conquest of the land, and then the exile from the land. And you begin to realize, oh, Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden. And then what God did was he created, in essence, a new garden. And he, and he promised that land to the people of Israel. And then just like Adam and Eve were exiled from Eden, the people of Israel, who were a, a new Adam, they were, in a sense, God's son. Remember, God said to Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. Let my son go. And then again, God's son was exiled from the land in which God was present but they went out they went out from the land into exile hearing promises that God was going to do a new a new work of salvation and and as the prophets described this new work of salvation that God was going to do on on behalf of his people they begin to make comparisons they start comparing the sojourn in Egypt that led up to the exodus to the sojourn in exile, ultimately in Babylon, that's going to lead up to this new exodus. And, and Jeremiah even says, he says, days are coming 
when you will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up the people from all the places to which he had scattered them. So what Jeremiah is saying is, this new work of salvation, it's going to be like the exodus from Egypt, but it's going to be so much bigger that you're going to forget all about the exodus from Egypt. And you're not going to identify God anymore by the exodus from Egypt. You're going to identify God by this new work of salvation that he does. So what Israel's prophets, men like Jeremiah, are doing is they are using Israel's past to interpret Israel's present and point to Israel's future. And then we come to the New Testament. And, and this is, all of this matters. All of this is important because when we get to the New Testament, we see that the backstory that the, the New Testament authors use to make sense of what God has done in Jesus is all this stuff about the exodus and the new exodus and the return from exile. This is why uh, when Jesus comes uh, in, in Matthew's gospel, he goes down into Egypt, then he comes up from Egypt, and then he's baptized in the, the River Jordan, and in the, then he goes out into the wilderness where he's tempted for 40 days. It's like he's recapitulating or redoing the history of Israel. But when he gets out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, whereas Israel had sinned and rebelled in the wilderness, Jesus overcomes and then as you continue through the life of Jesus, you keep seeing these patterns. So for instance, in, in John 6, Jesus feeds the multitudes. And then he goes into this long discussion about how uh, God gave manna from heaven in the wilderness to the people of Israel. But the bread of life is the one who comes down from heaven to give life to the world. And then Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And John has already, in, in John 1, shown John the Baptist identifying Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The point is, Jesus is the new Passover Lamb. Jesus is the manna from heaven. I think we enact that as we partake of the Lord's Supper. We, we're, we're fed by the bread of life on our sojourn through the wilderness, having been liberated from slavery to sin, and, and we're now pilgrimaging through the wilderness on the way to a new and better land of promise, which is the new heaven and the new earth. Brothers and sisters, your story is not the story that's on the magazines in the grocery store in the checkout aisle. Your story is not the story that is being held out to you in the Nike commercials. Your story is not the story that you see enacted in the movie theaters. Your story is here in the pages of scripture. This is how you're to understand your life. You are a liberated slave who is being, being sustained on your way to the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and new earth that, that comes down out out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. That's your home. That's the city that has foundations that you are seeking. So you're on your way to this promised land, and, you, and your story includes resurrection from the dead. Because the way that Jesus accomplished this new exodus was by being crucified for the sins of the world and then being raised from the dead. Maybe you're here this morning because somebody from this church has built a relationship with you, built a friendship with you, and they've invited you to come, and, and this is what they want you to hear. They want you to hear the world was made by God as good, and God is holy and he's righteous. The world is defined, and all the pain in your life results from sin. The, the world is defiled by sin, and God is not going to have a have it be that sin and evil have the last word. God is going to overcome sin and death and, and pain, and the way that God does that is he sends his only son who takes, who takes all the sins of the world on his shoulders and then bears all the weight of the awful wrath of God as he was crucified on the cross so that God could justly keep his word about punishing sin and then mercifully extend forgiveness to anyone who says, I agree with you, God, about what sin is. I'm going to turn away from it, and I'm going to trust in Jesus. I'm going to trust that Jesus died in my place. 
And, and what we want for you, if you're, if you're not a Christian, if you're visiting here this morning, what we want for you is for you to turn away from everything that's going to ruin your life and you to run to Jesus and you to, to, to embrace him as the one who died for you. And if you do that, this story is your story. You are a liberated slave. You are now on your way to a new and better land of promise, which is going to be a new and better Garden of Eden where you will dwell in the presence of God in a resurrected, glorified body. If you embrace this story, it changes everything. Let me give you an illustration of how it changes everything. I can remember as, when I was in high school, uh, my, my dad is here this morning, I wanted nothing more than to be a great athlete to, to win, hopefully, what I wanted to do, failed. What I wanted to do was win a state championship. My dad was the, the high school basketball coach, that's what I wanted. Didn't happen. Got to the end of the career, high school basketball career, no more high school basketball. It's over. The end. And I could sense within myself not wanting this to end, wanting to somehow keep this going, wanting to somehow treasure every aspect of this. But what would it have been if I had known, well, this is going to end, but I'm going into a new and better season of college basketball, which I didn't play college basketball. But if I knew that there was another season, well, this high school stuff, that's nothing compared to what, I've, what awaits me, right? That's, that's the way that the resurrection can function in our lives. If I know I am going to be raised from the dead, I am going to live in a new and better heaven and new earth, well, I'm free to throw my life away here. I am free to lay my life down here. I am free to take up the cross and follow Jesus here and, and let the world scorn me. Let the world say that they think I'm a bad person. The world story doesn't define me. The Bible's story defines me. And I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm, I'm gonna live for the resurrection body. And all this stuff from this life, I can let that go. Because a greater life awaits me. So we've seen the disruption in the garden. We've seen the promise sculpting the promise. We've seen the pattern of red imps. We've seen the coven of ants approaching the wedding cake. We've seen the exile and return, and then we leave the living room and we pass into the formal living room there, and what we encounter looks like the ring of power, right, from the Lord of the Rings, and it's, it's radiating light, it's glowing, it's a glow ring, because what's emanating out is the very glory of God from this new covenant that God is going to enter into when Christ comes for the marriage feast of the Lamb and the bride has made herself ready and she's clothed with white and she's glorious and then Jesus remakes the world and everything is right and new. You want to live for the glory of Christ. And do you know how you do that? You take up the cross and follow Jesus. It's interesting, in John chapter 12, Jesus says, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's talking about his own life. He's talking about the way that he's about to be crucified and then he's going to be resurrected and he's going to bear much fruit. And in his next words, he tells his followers to follow him in laying down their lives. He says in John 12, Verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. In being a grain of wheat that falls into the ground and dies so that it can bear much fruit. That's, that's what we live to do. We live to die so that we can die to live. So we've, we see the glow ring here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go back across the street to our neighbor's house where the neighbor shows us another movie. And in this movie, what's happening is that garden that was turned into something that looked like a field of battle with these, these onions that had exploded out of the earth when the dice rubbed their shins, that disruption caused by the, the dice rubbing their shins, that garden is re 
onioned. It's, it's a reunion. It's a cosmic reunion when God, through the death of Christ, reconciles the world to himself and makes all things new. There's a great line in uh, the novel, Gilead. Marilyn Robinson has that aged pastor write, I'm glad that the book says that he will wipe away every tear because nothing short of that will suffice. The Lord is going to wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. There will be no more sorrow or sighing. They will flee away. There will be no more, no more sea. The sun will never set on Jerusalem. And the best part, the Bible says, they will see his face. We will dwell in the presence of God in glorified bodies, perfectly fitted perfectly equipped to do the will of God forever. It will be glorious. This is, this is the true story of the world. This is the true story of the Bible. How do we live this way? How do we appropriate this, this, this story for ourselves and make it so that, so that all of this that we've been talking about shapes who we are and influences what we do? Well, two things. Number one... You want to increase your Bible intake. So I would urge you to read the Bible and, and if possible, listen to the Bible as much as you possibly can. It, it is so easy to get, in, get an audio Bible in our culture and load it on to some sort of mobile device and then as you, as you mow the lawn, as you do the dishes, as you drive from place to place, whatever, as you, as you sweep the floor, you can have the words of scripture rolling through your mind. So increase your Bible intake, and then secondly, what we want to do is we want to memorize and meditate on the Bible. Let me, let me apply this to something like um, people's desires sexually. I, I know that I know that there's probably someone in a crowd this, this size who's dealing with same-sex attraction. If the Bible defines the world for you, you will agree with the scripture that the only appropriate context in which human sexuality can be indulged is in a marriage between one man and one woman. And if the Bible defines the world for you, you will rethink your identity. You're not identified by your sexual desires. You're identified by the fact that you're made in the image of God. And, and by turning from sin and trusting in Jesus, you're redeemed and you're being reformed into Christ's likeness. And, and this is beginning to reshape and transform you into the image of Christ. If you deal with inappropriate desires for people of the opposite sex, what you want to do is you want to submit all those desires to the scriptures. And what that will do is cause you to banish all inappropriate fantasies. It will cause you to want only what's right and good, which is the proper expression of sexual relations between a man and a woman. Why is that significant? It's significant because God built marriage to be a display of the relationship between God the Father and Israel in the Old Covenant and Christ the Son and his bride, the church. So there's, a, there's a, a crucial reality that marriage is a reflection of the gospel. If you're here this morning and you don't, you don't understand why Christians are so uptight about marriage and who can get married, that's why. It's because we believe that God made marriage to be a reflection, an, a, a metaphor, an expression of the kind of relationship between himself and his bride, Christ and his bride. At the end of... At the end of, near the end of, win, of World War I, Winston Churchill, who was also prominent in, in Great Britain in World War II, as you probably know, Winston Churchill uh, fell out of power. And in his last address to the House of Commons, as he was taking his, his leave from the office that he had held, he was trying to urge them to take Constantinople. He, what he wanted was for the, the British to, to get away from that trench warfare that they were locked in, in in Europe there and come around to the underbelly and come up underneath uh, Germany and try to attack them from the backside. So as he left, as, as he closed his speech, he said, in the east, 
take Constantinople. Take it by ships if you can. Take it by soldiers if you must. Take it by whichever plan, military or naval, commends itself to your military experts. But take it. Take it soon. Take it while time remains. What is at stake in our lives is bigger than the outcome of World War I. The very glory of God and your eternal destiny is at stake in whether you will take the sword of the Spirit and fight. So, borrowing from Churchill, I want to say to you, take the sword of the Spirit. Take it by audio if you can. Take it into your heart. You must. Take it by whichever yearly reading plan or monthly study schedule commends itself to you. But take it. Take it soon. Take it while time remains. Let's pray. Father, would you make us like the blessed man of Psalm 1 who did not stand in the way of sinners or walk in the way of the wicked or seat, sit himself with the scoffers but delighted himself in the word of God. Lord, would you cause the scriptures to build the world for us, to describe and define reality for us. Lord, would you make us people of the word, cause the word of Christ to dwell richly in us, not so that we can show off our knowledge or play up our pride, but so that we can be Christ-like, so that we can be transformed, renewed, and made into the image of the Lord Jesus himself. Father, we ask this not for glory for ourselves, but that your name might be lifted high, that your will might be done, that your kingdom might come on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.